Luxury goods markets are one that most consumers don't understand. Maybe they dream of. And it's one that retailers have struggled with for years. We'll talk about that. How do you know that you're getting authentic, real products with Larry Brinbaum, the CEO of Shopworn. So thanks for listening to Bowties and Business. As always, I'm your host, Tim Kubiak. Larry, thanks so much for being here. Can you intro yourself a little bit? And then, as always, we're going to talk about how you built your business, how you got into it. And, and frankly, I'm a bit of a clothes horse and luxury goods guy. So I'm going to ask a bunch of questions because I want to learn. Great. Tim, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's, uh, it's really great to be here. Um, Shop One is, uh, has really been a 25-year making uh, from the start of my career as an entrepreneur. Uh, in my early days of actually get, getting in my car and driving around to stores. And at that point, I was in the designer clothing business, Ralph Lauren, Tommy Hilfiger, and driving around to stores at the end of the year, picking up their unsold merchandise and then reselling it on the internet, uh, really as the internet was just beginning to, to start, as, as eBay was starting, as, as the internet was becoming, um, becoming important to people. Uh, but they were still dialing in on a 96 board modem. I'm sure you remember that. I, I do, right? POS systems aren't what they are now, and online retailing really was kind of the Wild West back in those days. Yeah. So it, it's interesting you bring up Ralph Lauren, and I didn't know that they were in your background because I had read some of the history of the company and how they made so much of their their true income that kept them afloat, not from their high fashion and their purple label and things like that, but from their outlet business. So but you were on the other end of their luxury goods business, right? You were truly on the high end stuff? No, no. I, my, my biggest seller was probably the, um, the, uh, the, but, the button down shirt with polo pony on it. Okay. Sweater. So no, I remember it's funny, you know, uh, so Going into um, uh, like uh, Thanksgiving weekend and Black Friday, and we'd get so happy. Woohoo! We sold a sweater for forty two dollars. You know, <laughs> and it's funny when you first start. What excites you? And today, you know, one sweater it means nothing. You know, right? It's a volume yeah. business. We're just just getting into it, learning our way, as was everybody else. So, so what drew you into luxury goods, especially in the fashion side, because that's seasonal and trendy. I guess is the way to put it. Well, it's seasonal and trendy, I think, from the standpoint of, 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 of current merchandise and what's on the shelves today at the store. But, but Shop One's focus is on past season merchandise. There, there's a tremendous amount of people out there that don't have to have the latest and greatest and also don't want to buy something that's, that's pre-owned. So we really give them the opportunity to, to buy luxury, and luxury does not need to be need to mean expensive anymore luxury and, and own something they really wanted at a fraction of the price in the current season it, it's interesting that you bring that up so early in my career and i and i started my career in pittsburgh pennsylvania um and i kind of joke that i'm a clothes horse i absolutely am there was a guy that had a shop two blocks up from where my office was that had labels on it, Hart Schaffner Mark stuff. And it was always two seasons old, three seasons old. Mm -hmm. And I'd get it for, say, 200 a suit when they were at that time, you know, $800,000 suits. Yeah. And they were some of the best things I ever bought. And Taylor was phenomenal, too. But, right, for 200 bucks, I got a suit that was tailored that was a brand I could have never at that point in my career afforded on my own. And in going through the shop worn site, it was interesting because you're in the luxury watch space too, which I think is a very curious space, especially now with digital watches that there's still really a place for luxury goods and watches are still a thing. Watches are still a thing. I mean, you, certainly everybody looks at their phone to get their time, but a watch certainly for, for a man is a piece of art. Most men in my experience who collect watches they buy it as a piece of art, a piece of machinery. They're fascinated with how it works. 
you know, when you think about it, you know, people always say, why is it so expensive? It's a very valid question. But when you think about all the parts that are in, in, in a watch and that watchmaker who's putting it together by hand has to have a steadier hand, you know, than a, uh, than a heart surgeon or an eye surgeon. And, and, and that you have, you have to pay for that. A, a, a lot goes into designing the complication and, and what have you. But we are able, as, as you just said, we are able to uh, introduce brands to uh, aspirational buyers where, you know, they, they can't afford necessarily uh, the, the, the latest and the greatest item, but they really want to have an, a nice watch or a nice pair of earrings or a, a nice pair of sunglasses. To, to wear to work and wear out in the street. And we give them that opportunity. And in doing so, we also uh, are being an ambassador for the brands because these people, if they like that item, as they progress through their career, will, be, uh, will become full price customers of those brands. And we work hand in hand with the brand and the retailer to, uh, to do this and accomplish this. You know, that's an interesting point, and I think so often is missed, is buyers stay with brands as their economic status grows and changes with their careers if they've had a good experience. And I joked about buying my Hart Schaffner Mark suits. I still buy Hart Schaffner Mark suits, right? Um, my bow tie brand is the, the, of choice is not high end, but I've stayed with them because they took good care of me, right? And I've had great experiences, you know. Absolutely. We, uh, you know, you, you really hit on one of our uh, major points is, is cust customer service. And we try to give a white glove service to everybody. I come from a mom and pop business my whole life. And, and that's the way, no matter how big I get, that's the way I uh, intend my employees, my customer service people to, to run it. And I, I hope that never changes because without that, you're nothing. Uh, you know, you call our office, a human answers the phone. You don't have to press three for sales, two for customer service. You speak to a person immediately. And it's a, it's a rare commodity today, but I think it's the only way to do business properly. Yeah. You know, it's really funny. So in one of the companies that I work with, um, we wrestle with our PBX and our VoIP phone system all the time. And it's like, we want people to use it. But the truth is, I just want people to just call me directly, right? I, I don't want a customer to have to call in and find out where Tim is, right? Or where, where Justin is. Just freaking call me directly so I can help you with whatever you need. Good, bad, or indifferent. Yep, yep. I, I tell my people all the time. And, you know, I, I have a great relationship with, with my staff. And I, you know, I, I think that's important too, as a CEO, to build that relationship with, with everybody that works for you, where there's a mutual respect and nobody's more important than anybody else. And I, I tell them all the time, don't come to me and tell me, but I sent an email, they didn't respond. You see this, you use it, pick up the phone, make your call, find out the information you need and move on. Don't rely on, I know it's the world we live in today, but don't rely on it. We have to be better than everybody else. Yeah, email's so impersonal. We were kind of talking before we hit go, right? Sales is really about building relationships, whether it's for a single transaction or for multiple years, right? You can't do that over an email. So picking up the phone, huge. It's, it's all about relationships, whether it's, whether it's from the buying or the selling. It's, it's all around relation, relationships. We truly uh, build partnerships with our brands and, and with our customers as well. Customer calls in and would like to see how the earrings actually dangle on the ear. Yeah. We'll make an appointment. We'll take those pictures. We'll do a Zoom. We go that extra mile. You can't get that at most places. And I hope we always do that no matter how large we become. Because again, it's, it's, it's the way I want to run a business and it's the way I want to be treated as a customer. So let's talk about the growth that you've seen in Shop Warrant, right? So where, where did you start product set wise and what took you to where you are now and kind of the steps along the way? We started in October of 2015 is when uh, I launched the concept of Shop Warrant. 
Are you able to hear me? I'm getting some uh, uh, unstable message on my screen. You you had frozen for a second, but you're back. So just keep an eye on it. If we need oh, to, we okay. can replay and edit. So no worries. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, so um, started in October 2015, and we started out just in watches. We were originally born as shop worn watches, and within a very short few months. I realized that there's so much more out there and the watch business is extremely competitive. I'll always be in it. It's my, it's my first love and how I really got into this, into the internet retail business full force. But there are so many other products out there that are applicable to our concept. So within three months, we changed and, and became shop worn, just shop worn and expanded into jewelry within the first year. And as time went by, we slowly test and expand into other, other products. Now, as the pandemic was, um, was coming down on everybody in the world, we saw last March, April, a huge um, uh, influx of customers from China. Yeah. And at that point, and, and I, I think they termed it revenge shopping, uh, in China, they were just coming out of the pan of their first wave. We yep. were going yep. into it, and at that point, we made the decision, not knowing, but we made the decision with we're going to go full force and expand into the Pan Asian region well, with with an office with a team in Hong Kong, and hopefully by the end of this week, I do believe it will be by this Friday we will be launching a, an exact replica version of our website behind the Chinese firewall. So the Asian customer, the Chinese customer can have full access and speed because right now it's very difficult from China. Your slide slows down. It could take three minutes for a page to load. And we are all about the user experience and want that customer to, uh, to have a pleasant experience. So our building or have built and gotten licenses to have our company, our, our website within the Chinese firewall located in, uh, you know, I think in Beijing is where, uh, is where it's hosted. And uh, we really feel that that, uh, that region is going to um, expand our growth tremendously. We're, we're planning on it, we're hoping on it, and we know it's gonna happen. It is the fastest growing entry level and luxury segment probably in history from everything I've read. It's a brilliant business move. Yeah. And it, it's not only, it, it's not only selling into, uh, into the region, but there are tons of retailers there where you can't get the product out because they've already spent so much on duty and freight to get the product there that now we will also be able to develop these relationships within China with stores, suppliers, and, and the brand's agents to keep the product there and help them move their past season product. Wow, that's fascinating because you're right. The demand in some of the brands crossover, right? But they're going to have their own brands. They're such a population. That's real. Oh, that's going to be interesting. I'll be curious to hear how the logistics on all that goes from you in six months yeah. or a year. I, I mean, we've been shipping for the past year to China and, and it, hasn't, it hasn't been an issue. The only issue has been the slowness of our, as well as everybody else's website, when it's not based behind the firewall, you know, in, in mainland China. So we've taken that step and we got all the licenses and uh, should be launching on Friday. Okay, I've got to ask the nerdy question because I spent a lot of my career dealing with FX. Trading in local currency on that website? Are you doing it in Yon? Yes, but we get paid, we get transferred in dollars. So they can use their Asian credit card, if you will, their Hong Kong credit card. We have a platform that processes our payments there, but they tr they convert and transfer us in dollars. Okay. Wow. That's great. That, that was a great question. I'd love to get your uh, take on uh, cryptocurrency and the luxury business and or the internet world in general for, for retailers. So crypto is an interesting thing. And I was involved with, um, and I don't mind saying it, healthtrends.ai, where we had written a business plan last year and I was helping the CEO there kind of evolve it. They ended up 
getting National Sciences Foundation funding. So about as traditional as a dollar as you can. But at one point we wrote a business plan and it was tied to one of the cryptos. And it was tied actually to a venture fund that the founder of that currency had. And one day the fund was worth basically half a million dollars. It tanked a couple of days later. And then the same business plan that we had submitted was worth about 2.7 million about six weeks later as we were revolving the conversation. Business needs capitalization didn't change, but we were we were tied to those currency swings. So crypto, I think you're gonna see a couple of things. And the reason I say that is if you deal with FX, you've seen those kind of swings, right? You saw what happened to pound sterling with Brexit. You've seen the euro fluctuation and the euro was perhaps retaliatory for the American dollar being out really strong against Deutsche Mark and Lira and things for right. years. I, I think we're going to see some of that same kind of correction in crypto. Um, and if you look, fiat money is backed by government. We all know that, right? There is no gold standard anymore. So crypto, I think, is going to be here to stay. I think it's overvalued. So I do think you have a bit of a bit of a bubble, a bit of a tulip syndrome. And I do think you're going to see additional regulations on who can issue a coin and the rules around it. And if you followed what the SEC has done, right, people were just issuing coins and essentially, you know, didn't, didn't have the financial constraints a traditional banker would. I think it's going to push forward. I think you're going to see governments adopt it. And if you look, I pay for everything with an Apple phone anymore, right? Right. Yeah. I, I don't carry dollars. I carry dollars for tips when I travel and that's it. Otherwise I don't carry cash. And I was the last guy in the world I thought would give up cash. Um, so it's, it's going to be there. I don't think it's going to continue to be this crazy buy it and hold it and money making and like buying and holding gold kind of approach. I think it's going to become part and parcel to our day to day. Some of the more interesting things I've seen recently is actually not tied to specific crypto, but it's actually tied to moving money around the world in a legal way, but without government oversight for at-risk populations. And I was on a call with the founder of a wireless technology company that really has a back end on that. It's really intended to serve into Latin America, Africa, places like that. Americans, Europeans, we can move money pretty easy, right? right. Um, but also to take the FX out of it and take the high overhead fees out of it. And that, ironically, I had a friend whose son was in the FX business for a short period. And one of the things they were focused on was really the small multinational type of retailing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was fascinating to me to see them out, you know, mom and pops that were crossing, whether it was US into Canada or now UK sterling into Europe. And I think crypto is going to be the, the great equalizing force is the long part of the answer there, right? It's, 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 it's going to be fascinating. We are going back and forth having discussions if and when we should start accepting it. Uh, there are different options out there, you know, where we can accept it, but we don't have to hold on to it. It'll get converted into dollars right away. And uh, that may be the, way, be the way to go, at least to start. Yeah. And it's interesting, the decimal places, if you look at like Ethereum over, you know, Bitcoin, um, you look at Ethereum and the gas fees you pay for every transaction and everything that goes with that is always, there, there's so many things and I understand that's the whole security story on it. There's so many things you got to factor in where you don't bank fees as we know them with a traditional dollar are pretty straightforward. Yep. yep. Yeah. Should be interesting. And I, you know, I, I think the only governments have to start in some way regulating it if it's going to be here to stay. They do. So the, the, the counter I'll have to that is if you look at the power central bankers have given away in the last two economic downturns, the question is, is can central banks, right? We did, we certainly in 2008 had the qualitative easing, right? Um, we've had one of the largest stimulus packages and not political commentary. So nobody hate me, right? It's fiscal commentary. Um, and it's really no different than what crypto's done. And central bank's ability to move a market, you know, the Fed just last week before we did this said, oh, it's getting tight. We have inflationary pressures. We might need to raise rates. And Wall Street tanked it. Right. Right. And if you read European Central Bank doesn't have much more control. UK pretends they do. I don't know that I buy it. So. We'll see. It's, it's a... Uh... 
it's a fluid situation, right? Is that the proper terminology? Yes. Yeah, that's a, that's the a proper terminology. Yeah, and just for the record, everybody, I've got some sterling at my house. I've got some euros at my house. I'm set either way. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny, though, right? Because when you get CEOs together, right, and founders together, one of the things you have to think about outside of your core business is really how that money flows. Yeah. 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 Do you run, do you have uh, groups where you have a bunch of CEOs sitting around the table? So I actually do. It's funny you say that. As a business, no. Um, but as a group of friends, I actually have put a group together. And ironically, not a plug for what I'm doing, but I'm actually bringing people in from SaaS companies and other places next week to Chicago um, to run a focus group for what I'm doing for Zeppel because we need that outside guidance. So I'm looking at building board of advisors there. I don't run a CEO's coaching group. I kind of facilitate a group of friends who I've got a friend in the software business. I've got friends in the app and the AI ML business, and we just sit around and talk. So if you'd like to join uh, aside from this, I'm happy to start getting okay. in on those. Great. Thank you. That would be yeah, done. Yeah. And by the way, most of them are in your part of the world, not mine. Cause they oh, really? are my old life. Yeah. Uh, Westchester, Bridgewater, uh, the city proper are, are my three favorites. So. Right. Great. That would be fun. Cool. Yeah, we'll definitely do that. Thank you. Thank you. That would be great. So talk about the evolution. So you start, you started with watches with Shopworn. You moved into jewelry. Correct. I see you have handbags. What's next? We have, we have handbags. We have sunglasses. We have writing instruments. I know writing is a lost art, but it is, there are incredible amount of collectors of fine writing instruments as well. And, uh, you know, there's nothing like writing with a nice pen. I mean, yes, I know we don't write anymore. We, we, we type, but as a, as, a, as a CEO, as a businessman, I think you always need a pen and we're always taking notes. And it, it's just great. And writing instruments is, is a huge business for us. And we want to expand that as well. Um, so handbags, you mentioned, writing instruments, jewelry, uh, wallets, belts, ties. We do have some ties now. We try at least at this point to stay out of the sizable business just because we're not set up for it yet. But ties for the most part are, are not sizable. Right. Um, interestingly, today, we're, we're doing a test today, uh, launching today of um, Porsche design sneakers, believe it or not. Oh, interesting. And it's, it's something, it's not going to be on my site for good. It's a four, I think a four day event, 72 hours, uh, should be launching in about an hour of Porsche design sneakers in and out, testing the market, testing the luxury. Yes, sizable, I know against my own advice, but in a sneaker, I figured it's pretty easy. <laughs> I, I was just say you're not, you're not dealing with collar and sleeve lengths and fit. Exa Exactly. And neck and neck length. So, uh. We're excited to see how it performs. And I can, you know, certainly report back to you in the next 72 hours and let you know, because uh, we have no idea. Never, haven't been in the clothing sector in 25 years. So I have no idea. It's interesting to me because you talked about aspirational buyers very at the very beginning of the conversation. And sneaker collectors is a subculture of establishing aspirational buyers. That's its own world. It's its own world. It's incredible that uh, eBay, a company like StockX, they were built just to sell sneakers. And you see 18-year-old uh, kids who have these thriving internet sneaker businesses or trading card businesses. It's phenomenal. Yeah. One, one of my favorite stories is one of my best friends was a Catholic high school English teacher made like $15,000 a year. And when eBay first started, he started brokering sports memorabilia on eBay. I mean, early days, early days. Now he's, he did it right. He was at the right place at the right time. You know, he bought, well, just like in your business, he knew what there was going to be demand for. In some cases, maybe he cornered the market to drive up price, right? But he's built an amazing life for himself in the last 20 plus years of that world and you know i look i've got a buddy whose son is a freshman at ohio state 
in the sneaker business, ironically, which is the only reason I know about it. And, you know, he's been buying and brokering steel, or sneakers with his lawn mowing money since he was probably 14. And he's got a good little, you know, he, got, he could make a living if he had to doing this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't think what I'm selling is collectibles. Again, it's past season stuff, but it's going to be a great value. And um, we hope we find a new sector to get into sooner rather than later. We're, again, very, very excited to see the results. And I will share them with you. Good. Yeah, I'll, I'll be curious. <laughs> so I'm going to come back to your writing in in instruments, right? Uh, it's sort of like watches. It's a thing that's lost in time. And, and admittedly, I watch too many car and men's fashion YouTube channels. But I think some of those classic men's goods in that segment are catching a younger audience that maybe would have been lost with my generation um, had it not been for the internet. Have you seen influencers play a role in some of the type of customers you get? Uh, we... Yes, but not in the writing instruments, uh, more so in the influences have been successful in sunglasses and handbags, even in jewelry. And sure. interestingly, at least to date, I believe more, uh, more from the female side than the male side. But it's, it, for, for us growing the, the female segment, because watches has notoriously been a men, man's world. Man's world. In the female segment segment has been a big priority of ours to get that uh, you know the, the customer base up and, and make it more equitable. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. So I, I'll give you a couple people off there that I think you had to go ping. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so great. Um, what? So China is next. Normally, I have to ask people what's next. So go, going to China is next building an Asian market, essentially, as you will there. What do you see for your shop worn after that? Because that's a big thing to take on. It's a big thing. So, so Ch China is next, but China's been been in operation for a year. Uh, but, you know, launching again for a better user experience in the next week or so. Uh, in the past four or five months, we've actually expanded to Korea. We now have our site translated into Korean as well as having a customer service representative there so clients can speak in their own language at, you know, during their day as opposed to our day here, uh, as well as our staff in, in China. We are expanding as well to the whole region. And each one, each region is its own language, you know, to Singapore and, and uh, other Pacific Rim countries. Uh, what's next after China? I don't know. The site is now created where we can choose anywhere we want and within weeks have that site translated into their local language. So it's just a matter of finding what's next. If you have any, uh, any suggestions, we're certainly open. I know we do, we do a nice business in Australia, so that may be on the radar. We do a very nice business in, um, in the UAE and Dubai, places of nature. So those also may be something that's in the near future. It's interesting because you just made me think of something. You always had the duty-free shops, right, as you traveled UAE, you know, Heathrow. And, and I had some of the same temptations, honestly, when I went to your site right before we hopped on. I'm like, mm, don't buy the watch today. Wait, <laughs> right? Because it's there and it's easy. But the one thing we didn't really hit on is with you, you know what you're you, – when a customer purchases – they know they're getting authentic product. Can you talk through that a little bit more? Because I don't think we did that justice yet. A a absolutely. And thank you so much for bringing that up. Uh, so the shop Shopworn sells merchandise from past seasons. And we only have two sources of supply, the brands themselves or their authorized retailers. Uh, people in our, in my industry, if you're in the quote unquote, secondary market, which I guess I would be considered in the secondary market, they hide from the brands. We get endorsements from the brands. If you go onto our site, you'll see multiple endorsements from many brands that Shopworn does business with. Uh, so brands are actually supporting our concept of selling past season, excuse me, past season merchandise at a, at a, at a, 
discounted rate at a, at a great value for the consumer. And it's just something that's never been seen before in, uh, in the luxury business. Additionally, we are, um, we are able to uh, help with the sustainability issue. Sustainability is a big issue today. Uh, we're able to help those brands recycle, whether it's built items or not built items that they have parts on from past seasons where they can actually assemble things if they have some things left over and, and market it and use everything up and really be sustainable. And, you know, we, we've taken a step from our packaging as well. We try, we use everything that's recyclable so we can really do our part in, uh, in keeping this, uh, this cycle going because just saying it, not doing it, you know, doesn't make any sense. So we try to put the proof, uh, the pudding where our mouth is and, uh, really, do our part. And, and it definitely helps the brand. Sustainability is a huge issue in the industry. I'm sure you've, uh, over the years, seen articles where companies have uh, burned products, not yeah. to, to have them end up in the market and have received, uh, you know, tremendous grief from that action. Yeah, it's, the fashion industry in the last couple of years has really gotten under fire for fast fashion and the environmental damage. And one of the things I found interesting is I actually brought, I think it was network television a couple of weeks ago. I started seeing, and I'm, look, I wear the same kind of shirt, same kind of ties all the time. I'm, you know, I'm predictable, so I'm not going to be trendy. But if you look, they were saying invest in quality for the last 10 or 15 years. And the truth is I have 15 year old suits that look like brand new because if you buy quality, it does last. And I did it as a status statement, but now it's almost as much a, an economical statement and an environmental statement going, yep, I can wear this brand, but this brand's going to fit me forever. And I will never get thin. I'm always going to be this size. So we're good. It's, it, it's true. But I, I, I think the important thing to what you just said, and I, I think I said it earlier as well, is luxury today and buying quality doesn't necessarily have to mean you're spending a fortune. No, that's true. You can really be a, a very smart consumer and get what you want. Again, may not be the current product, but get what you want for a reasonable price. And, and then as, as we all grow and become more successful in all our lives, then you become a lover of that brand, as, as we said earlier. Yeah, L literally, I started with my favorite brand of suit with the guy with the corner shop in the racks. That I'm sure he bought them off of last season from, you know, Dillard's or whoever it was at that point. Yeah. <laughs> Su Su Suits is very close to my heart. My father used to be a clothing manufacturer. Did so, he? Uh, he made just... all, the, all the clothes in, in Eastern Europe. So uh, he spent, that's where my father spent most of his life uh, traveling to Eastern Europe to, uh, to the factories. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Fabric is a lost art. We could do a whole episode on fabric quality. And this is, I know this isn't a fashion show, but it's something that's been lost. If you look at the mainstream department stores, the quality is going down, the blend mix is going up. And people like your father that dealt in good fabrics probably their entire career would not be happy. <laughs> I mean, he would go to Italy, he would buy the fabrics and send them to his to the factory in Poland or Budapest, wherever it may be. And yeah. Yeah, but again, it's, you know, the, you and I are getting off course here, but the hand on a nice piece of wool, you wouldn't even know it's wool. And that's, uh, you know. That's that's exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's funny. Yeah, I can go down that route all. One of my partners, um, her father is in the fabric business in London for years. So, you know, I always was like, hey, what can you teach me about fabric today? <laughs> You, you can't you can't take it out. My brother and I always say we can change our business, but you can't take the garmento out of us. You know, we walk in a store and automatically I'm grabbing that sleeve and going like this with my hand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a closing question. We'll go back to watches. Yes. What was your first good watch and what's your favorite? My first watch when I got into this business was a Chrono Swiss Opus in steel not sure if you're familiar with chrono swiss but it was not. uh that they, they have a very uh standardized case and it was a fairly thick watch and it had an open face and an open back 
Oh, nice. All, all, all the workings. And that was my first watch when I got into this business. Before that, I thought you purchased the watch in Rite Aid or, or, uh, or CVS. I didn't know, or, you know, or Macy's for a, for a fine yeah. watch of, you know, $79. Yeah. What did I know? But uh, uh, so, so that was my first. I don't know that I have a favorite. Uh, I like a lot of the um, a lot of the smaller brands, the b- boutique brands. Currently, just as a as a comment from a uh, when I when I put a suit on, I'll wear an H Moser, which is a very elegant, thin watch, uh, similar to similar to a a nice, fine, simple Patek Philippe, something okay. along those lines. Uh, there are a lot of great brands out there that are not the A brands that you see, Eberhard, Graham. I, I mean, there are fantastic watches out there and everybody can get something in their price range and really, you know, have, have fun with it and, and be thrilled to wear it. Yeah, and, you know, so I, I used to love going into the city and going to Tornado and just drooling at the watches. So obviously I'm also a long-term watch guy. So right. Tornado, as of two weeks ago, changed their name. I don't know if you were aware. I didn't know that. I missed that. It was purchased a year and a half or two years ago by Bukra. Uh, you know, you walk over Europe, Bukra is yeah. all over the place. Yep. They purchased Tornado about two years ago. And as of two weeks ago, the time machine does not say Torno anymore. It now says Bukhara. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. And all, all the stores throughout throughout the U.S. will be changed to Bukhara eventually. I don't believe they've all been done yet. Interesting. You know, the, the brands keep evolving. <laughs> yep, yep. Cool. Larry, thanks so much for being here. Anything we should have touched on that we didn't? Um, I th- think the only thing that we didn't touch on is really the uniqueness of the shop worn concept. Uh, Go for it. A- as you know, a- as we've been discussing, there are so many websites out there that are selling either gray market goods or pre-owned goods that you can't verify 100% the authenticity on it. Uh, it's a, it's a big problem and, and consumers have to have concern over that because you're spending your hard earned money and you don't necessarily know, even, even on pre-owned, you're buying it and it was certified, but it doesn't mean that one of the one of the wheels inside was not used with a manufacturer's part. The wheel could be exactly the same from the same manufacturer as the, you know, as the brand uses. But if it's not that branded part, it's not 100 percent authentic. And it's a big deal. You're spending your money for something. So get what you're buying. With Shopworn, you don't have that concern. We don't need to have authenticators. We Everything we sell comes direct from the brand. You can be 100% certain that it is coming completely with every single part, the way the brand, the manufacturer wanted it to be because it came from them. And from a repair standpoint, we won't fix a watch or a piece of jewelry with a part that's not from the brand, whether the watch has to go back to them or our watchmaker uh, has a, uh, you know, has a parts account and is authorized by that brand to repair the watch. And it sounds like such a simple thing, but the customer really has to be wary of where and what they're purchasing to make sure they're getting the value that, uh, that they expect. Yeah. And that's huge in the watch business for people that aren't watch people, right? The fact that your watch was serviced by an authorized service center with authorized parts, you're exactly right. Because that determines the value swing down the road massively. Absolutely. And and people get, not intentionally, but people get hurt. Um, Thousands of people probably get hurt every day. And, you know, it's one less thing we have to worry about in life. We all have a lot to worry about. So, yeah, but being able when you're making your purchases, whether it's in the supermarket, buying your, you know, you want to know the salad you're buying doesn't have uh, E. coli or, or something in it. So that's right. Yeah. Right. That it's been kept at temperature, washed properly. Yeah. yeah. Same it's, thing. That's right. It's, it's, it's no different from things we use every day in our lives. That's a great closing point. Thanks again for taking the time. 
Great. Thank you so much, Tim. So it was a great, uh, great discussion, and I look forward to, uh, to many more.